All right. So last time we talked about strain, uh, about deformation, how objects change, um, that we want to start connecting that back to what we talked about in our the first part of the class, which was stress and loads. How do we know how much an object changes based upon how much of a load is applied to it? Uh, and that's where a stress strain diagram comes in. And we start to understand and think about what is it, what difference does it make, uh, uh, which material we're using, um, and how does that affect uh, the way that it strains. And the way that we're going to do that is to draw uh, what are called stress strain diagrams. Um, and these are diagrams that are uh, material specific. So like a particular kind of steel is going to have a particular stress strain diagram. And it's going to tell us how those two things are related to each other. When I apply this much stretch to a material, how much does it deform? That's what stress strain is doing. Uh, and these are found experimentally. So here we've got a tensile tester, um, <laughs> sort of <laughs> from the 1950s, apparently. Um, and you take a specimen here that looks something like this. That's you know, uh, we want to have some way that we can apply an even as strain as possible. And so we make this sort of thicker here. And we're interested in what's happening to this part of our specimen as we pull on that or press on that. So here you can see this uh, specimen is being pulled apart uh, by this machine uh, by, uh, as you can imagine, a great deal of uh, uh, force. Uh, and then we pay attention to how much a particular length changes, right? So we might mark this length here. Um, and as we apply a higher and higher load, uh, we're going to get a larger and larger stress in that, within that specimen, within this section of the specimen, uh, and that's going to create a strain. That's going to change the length of uh, L0 here. And so as we increase that uh, load, we note down how much that's changing. Uh, that definition, uh, if we think about um, our definitions here, this is stuff we've already looked at, right? So what is stress? Well, it's going to be the load over the area here. Uh, and then strain, as we measure this, is going to be the change in length of this distance over its original distance. Those are going to be my strain. Now, these are, you'll notice, what would happen as I pulled on this uh, and I stretched this? Well, the cross-sectional area is actually going to change, right? <laughs> because it's going to, if, if I just think about, well, I'm going to have the same amount of mass. If I spread that mass out over a longer length, uh, then it's going to be skinnier. Um, when we talk about engineering stress and strain on a stress-strain diagram, this doesn't account for that, right? We're, we continue to divide by A0 uh, and by L0. If we want to know true stress or true strain, we'd have to keep track of the change in the diameter here, uh, and the change in the length here. Um, and that would be called true stress or true strain. That's mostly used by material scientists uh, and maybe material engineers. Uh, engineers in other fields almost always use uh, nominal stress or engineering stress. That's its name. <laughs> okay, so let's actually look at a stress strain diagram and see if we can start to figure out how to read one of these. You may have encountered this in, in uh, material science uh, too, if you took that course. Um, but they are challenging, and so it's even if you have, it's a, it's a good thing to review here. So this is uh, the stress-strain diagram of what's called a ductile material. A lot of meta metals would fit that category. Uh, and what that means is, is that we can actually stress it, uh, or, or strain it rather, as I move left to right here, I'm lengthening uh, my specimen. It's getting longer. Um, and a ductile material won't break immediately um, as, it starts to, uh, as it starts to get longer. As I go up on this plot, I'm increasing my load. I'm increasing my uh, stress. Um, and you can see that for the most part, as I increase my stress, uh, my piece of metal is going to get longer, which is what we'd expect. So let's talk about each of the different parts of this stress-strain diagram. The first one is called the elastic region. 
An elastic, I'd like you to think about um, a rubber band when you think about elastic, right? If I pull a rubber band, I let go, it snaps back uh, and it's going to be essentially in the same condition that it was before. It's going to return to its original shape. And that's what happens in the elastic region as well. If we have elastic deformation, the material returns to its original shape. So if I add a load, you know, say I add uh, this much stress to my specimen, uh, it's going to increase in length by this much. Its strain is going to be, or the ratio of the increase in length is going to be this much. But then if I let go of that strain, uh, my piece of metal is going to return back like a rubber band to its original state. That lasts until you reach what's called the yield stress, which is up here, uh, which is for our purposes is going to be the same as the elastic limit. Right? Once you get to the end of the elastic limit, you get what's called plastic change. Uh, and that plastic change means if I create a strain on uh, my material, some uh, residue of that strain is going to remain even after I uh, remove my load. So I've actually physically changed the, uh, the molecular structure of that material um, because it doesn't return back to its original shape. This elastic region is also sometimes called the proportional region uh, because stress is proportional to change, right? As I move along this line, you can see that's a linear line. Uh, a certain amount of stress, if I increase my load by a certain amount, it's always going to increase the strain by, that, uh, by the same uh, amount, okay? That's why we call this the proportional region. Uh, and we'll get to this, uh, the slope of that line is actually what's called uh, your modulus of elasticity, uh, which is E. And that's going to be a really important uh, value for us with uh, when we start dealing with uh, materials. Okay, that's the elastic limit. That's the proportional limit. Just remember, elastic is your rubber band. It's going gonna, it's gonna to spring back to where it was before. The next region, uh, this dark orange umber sort of color here, uh, is what's called a yielding region. Not all metals uh, have this region, uh, but in the yielding region, um, you have uh, an increase in the length of your specimen without uh, increasing or significantly increasing the stress. Okay, so once I reach that yield, uh, I can keep the same load on my metal uh, or my specimen and it's going to continue to expand, right? You might think of kind of a piece of hard gum, right? If I <laughs> pick up that gum off the sidewalk, right, it's hard and I can kind of pull it. It's not going to pull much, but once it starts to stretch, I don't have to add a lot more stretch. It's going to keep, uh, it's going to keep stretching out. Uh, with the same uh, load applied to it. So that's our, uh, our yielding region. Uh, and like we said before, the material at that point is behaving plastically. Uh, it's plastic deformation. It's not going to return back uh, elastically uh, to its original shape. We have changed something about the internal structure of our material um, that means it's not going to bounce back. The changes here are all about intermolecular forces, uh, and you can stretch those intermolecular forces, but they're going to pull back. They're going to try and go back to their nice equilibrium point. Here, we're actually altering that structure uh, in some way, which means we don't spring back. Once we get to this light green area here, we're in the strain hardening region. This is, again, plastic behavior, but you can see we're increasing our load. Um, and an interesting thing is happening here. We're actually increasing the strength of the material as we go along here. Um, that's a really weird thing, right? You know, that, that by plastically deforming it, we're actually uh, increasing how strong it is. Um, but that's what's happening. Uh, and it's making it more brittle. We'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, but you can see I'm adding a higher and higher load to it, uh, and it's withstanding that load. It's not breaking, 
Um, it is yielding, right? It's getting longer and longer as we move left to right on this, uh, on this plot uh, until we actually reach what's called the ultimate stress here, um, which is the largest load, uh, the largest stress that this material can uh, withstand. Once we get past that ultimate stress, you have what's called necking. And here's a little picture of necking. It's not hiding in the bushes with your... <laughs> with your <laughs> I'm not going to talk about necking with you all. <laughs> so this is, ne this is necking uh, with material science necking. Um, and you can see that the material is starting to deform visibly. Uh, that cross-sectional area is getting visibly smaller, right? So our true stress here uh, deviates a lot from our uh, engineering stress because here we're dividing by a smaller and smaller value as that cross-sectional area gets smaller and smaller. Uh, this is the beginning of a complete failure here, right? And if you've ever tried to like, uh, you know, break a paperclip or something and you kind of bend it and bend it and bend it, you can see it getting weaker and weaker um, you can actually see when you look at that, that that, that paper clip is getting skinnier at that point, uh, and that's, that's some necking there. Uh, and we've then finally reached the fracture stress, um, at which point uh, our specimen breaks, right? So we have a crack and then it, uh, and then it fails completely. Notice here this true stress line. I mentioned that before here. You can see the big deviation is here as you get necking, as that cross-sectional area gets smaller and smaller. But even in here, that cross-sectional area is smaller than it initially was. Uh, and so it's going to change our true stress uh, and make it slightly different from our uh, nominal stress or our engineering stress. Now, I mentioned that uh, different materials have different stress strain diagrams. And in fact, the one we've been looking at looks a little bit like this mild steel one here, right? We have a, the elastic region here. We have yielding region here. Then we get strain hardening. Uh, and finally, we get in the necking region. Um, that's what a ductile material looks like. But you can see from this plot that other kinds of materials have very different stress strain diagrams. And let's just talk about a couple of them real quick. Uh, aluminum doesn't have a defined yield point. So we move from an elastic region into, you see it also doesn't have a yielding uh, region, into strain hardening. Um, but there's not a clear point. Is that happening here or here or here? Um, and so we have other tools that we can use, and we're not going to go into them uh, in this class, to define a, a yield point for uh, something like aluminum. Glass and ceramics are really brittle, so when they get past the elastic region, they just break, right? So that they don't uh, have the same kind of ability. That's what ductility is. It, it can have some plastic deformation without fracturing. Uh, glass and ceramic has very little plastic deformation uh, before it just uh, completely fractures. Wood is not isotropic, so if I do a tensile test on it in two different directions, I'll get very different stress strain diagrams. If I pull along the grain, or uh, so that the grains are running axially, uh, it's going to be really strong. If I pull across the grain, uh, it's going to be much less um, resistant to, um, to stress. Rubber doesn't have a proportionality region. It doesn't have uh, uh, a nice uh, proportional um, linear plot here, right? It's curved all along. Uh, and so that rubber is quite different. Um, but you don't need to remember all these things. With a little practice, um, you'll just look it up on a stress strain diagram and you can start to glance at one of these and get a sense of, yeah, I, I can see how uh, that material behaves. All right, so a couple of warm-up questions. One thing to note as you look at this, this stress strain diagram has two different uh, x-axis sets of values, right? Here the higher numbers are in black, 
The first part of the stress strain diagram is in green here, uh, and those apply to this green line. So this elastic section here is the same as this one, okay? But we put it on two different plots so you can see some more details uh, in that elastic region and the yielding region. So we'll go through these. I'm not gonna uh, say a whole lot about these because I think you can get them from the notes. Uh, but the first question is, when does the material stop reacting linearly to stress, right? So when does the proportional region uh, end? When does it stop being a straight line? <laughs> That's a big hint. I'll go on to the next one. So obviously pause when you need to. Uh, what is the proportional strain limit? Um, and so when you're looking for strain, you're looking on the x-axis here, okay? Uh, so when does that proportional region end? It's a very similar question to one, uh, but depending on which axis you're looking at. At what stress would the steel finally actually fracture? When would it break apart? Obviously, that's going to be towards the end of your plot, right? And pause. I'll go into four. Does the steel have a constant yielding region? So we talked about the four regions of a ductile material. Uh, elastic region, yielding region, strain hardening, and necking. Uh, not every material has all four of those. Um, Now, thinking quantitatively, if this steel experienced a strain of 0 0.05, would it return to its original shape after the stress was removed? So find that stress on your x-axis, or your, that strain on your x-axis. Uh, is it still in the elastic region? That's essentially what this question is asking. And then finally, if I wanted to apply a, a cause a strain of 0.15, um, what stress would I need to apply to do that? Okay, and looking for a kind of ballpark answer here, uh, but see, we're gonna it, it, to do that. You, that's going to be one of these black numbers, right? So that's going to be a pretty significant stress. Um, how much stress do I need to apply to actually? Uh, get that strain of 0.15. And that's today's.